The early years of heavier-than-air aviation included famous inventors such as Wilbur and Orville Wright from Dayton, Ohio, Glenn Curtis from Hammondsport, New York, Brazilian-born Alberto Santos Dumont, and Louis Blériot from France. Although they differed in their origins, temperaments, and design strategies, all of them were male and all of them were white. In 1892, however, a tiny baby was born in northeastern Texas who eventually would change the face of aviation, both figuratively and literally. On January 26th of that year, Elizabeth Bessie Coleman was born in Atlanta, Texas. Her parents, George and Susan Coleman, were African-American sharecroppers who could neither read nor write. In 1894, the Coleman family moved to Waxahachie, Texas, a town about 30 miles south of Dallas. At age six, Bessie started attending school in a one-room shack, four miles from her home. In 1901, tired of the racism that faced black people in Texas, George Coleman, being part Choctaw, decided to move to Oklahoma, then called Indian Territory. Susan Coleman, however, insisted on staying in Texas with her daughters. Susan began working for a white family. When cotton harvest came around, mother and daughters augmented the family's meager income by picking cotton. In 1910, Bessie enrolled in the Agricultural and Normal University, a blacks-only school in Langston, Oklahoma. Poverty forced her to leave after just one year, so she returned home and earned money by washing clothes. When Bessie turned 23, she moved to Chicago to live with two older brothers, Walter and John. Walter worked regularly as a Pullman porter, but John was often unemployed. While still living down in Texas, Coleman had announced to her mother that she wanted, quote, to amount to something, unquote. Now, up in Chicago, she sought a better life than that of just a maid, cook, or laundress. She attended the Burnham School of Beauty Culture and then found a job as a manicurist in a men's barber shop on Chicago's South Side. In 1917, when the United States entered World War I, Coleman's brothers went to Europe as part of Illinois' all-black 8th Army National Guard. After the war ended, the brothers returned home. One brother started teasing Bessie about her limited circumstances, saying that French women had much better career prospects. Some French women, he added, even took to the skies as pilots. Coleman took her brother's remark as a provocation to learn to fly, but she quickly discovered that no American aviation school would train women or minorities. Undeterred by the limits placed on her sex and race, she developed a plan to make it to France and learn to fly. She took French lessons, found a better paying job, and enlisted the aid of African Americans to bring her plan to fruition. One person who helped Coleman financially was Robert Abbott, founder and owner of the Chicago Defender, one of the city's leading black newspapers. She also sought help from Jesse Binga, an ambitious real estate owner and founder of a bank that bore his name. In 1920, claiming to be four years younger than her actual age of 28, Coleman applied for an American passport. On November 20th of that year, she boarded the SS Imparator in New York Harbor and steamed for Europe. In northern France, Coleman found training at the Caudron Brothers Aviation School. Founded by the French airplane builders René Caudron and his brother Gaston, the aviation school was at the time the most famous one in France. Coleman's training plane was the Newport Type 82 a common trainer of the era. During her seventh month course, she learned how to make banking turns, how to recover from tailspins, and how to loop the loop. With a pilot's license dated June 15, 1921, Bessie Coleman became the first black person in the world, man or woman, to earn an international pilot's license. After finishing her course in northern France, she went to Paris for additional training. In September, she steamed for home on the SS Manchuria. 
When the ship arrived in New York, newspaper men, both white and black, met the ship in order to meet America's first black woman aviator. While in New York, Coleman was wined and dined by the African-American community. She attended performances of a play called Shuffle Along, the first successful musical in America starring black actors. With lyrics written by pianist U.B. Blake and his friend Noble Sissel, the musical included performers such as Florence Mills and the incomparable Ethel Waters. When Coleman returned to Chicago, the Defender printed a photograph of her mother holding a silver cup that the flyer had received in New York from Shuffle Along cast members. In the 1910s and 20s, American pilots had few ways to make a living. Most commonly, they earned income by holding air shows, performing feats like parachuting, challenging race cars to high-speed dashes, or looping the loop. To succeed on the air show circuit, Coleman quickly realized that she needed more flight training. But American flying schools continued to refuse her admittance. In February of 1922, therefore, Coleman returned to New York City to prepare for a second trip to France. Once again, New York's African-American community entertained the flyer. She met again with cast members of the Shuffle Along musical and addressed the 2,500-member Metropolitan Baptist Church, which gave her a standing ovation. On February 22nd, back she steamed to France, this time on the SS Paris. After two months of flight training in France, Coleman went to Holland, where she met the Dutch airplane designer Anthony Fokker. In late May, she went to Germany, soon borrowed a plane, and flew it over the Kaiser's Palace in Berlin. She stayed ten weeks in that country, meeting many flyers. Among them was Robert Talen, a German aviation pioneer, one of the Wright brothers' European employees, and designer of the Albatross D-3 fighter plane of World War I. In early August, Coleman steamed for home on the SS Nordam. Newsmen once again met her ship when it docked in New York Harbor. Realizing that dramatic stories would entice air shows to hire her as an aerial performer, she claimed that she had learned to fly after serving with the Red Cross in Europe during World War I. She also claimed to have met German royalty and politicians, and that she had flown a large German seaplane. Coleman's chance to fly before the American public first came at Curtis Field in Garden City, Long Island, in early September of 1922. New York's all-black 15th Infantry paraded on the field, and the flyer herself wore a military-style outfit while flying a Curtis JN-4. Upon landing, the flyer received a bouquet of flowers from none other than Trinidad's famed aviation pioneer and a self-promoter in his own right, Hubert Fauntleroy Julian. The September 4th issue of one of New York's papers reported that at least 1,000 spectators, mostly African American, had attended the event. In mid-October, at Checkerboard Field in Chicago, Coleman made her first flights in front of her adopted city. The airport's owner, a white flyer named David Benke, who supported her flying efforts, provided the plane for her performance. In January of 1923, Coleman boarded a train for the West Coast to meet with officers of the Coast Tire and Rubber Company in California in hopes of doing aerial advertising for the firm. After visiting the company's manufacturing plant in Oakland, she headed south to Rockwell Air Intermediate Depot in San Diego, where she acquired a Curtis JN-4. In early February, Coleman took off from Santa Monica to fly 25 miles to a fairground celebration in Los Angeles. At 300 feet, her engine stalled and the plane then crashed. Coleman was knocked unconscious and suffered a broken leg, three broken ribs, several cuts and other injuries. Rescuers took her to St. Catherine Hospital in downtown Santa Monica, where it took her three months to recuperate. It took over two more years for Coleman to return to flying.
get better. It's gotta get better. It will get better. Cause God is in God in control. Find your praise within your heart. Hold it close. Don't ever be far. But you'll be alright, it will get better. It's gotta get better. It will get better. It's gotta get better. It will get better. But God is in yourself or point to your neighbor and say it will get better your finances are getting better your sickness is getting better your children are getting better because God is in control yes it will it will get better we're up to our response of reading at this time praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord our response of reading comes from Psalm 111, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. All he has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Come on, clap your hands if you believe that. It will get better. It's got to get better. It will get better. It's got to get better. It will get better. Anybody soul been anchored in the Lord? I'm gonna go back and do this one. Rest in peace, matter of fact, to the writer who wrote this song, Douglas Miller.
my soul has been naked. 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 The billows may roll, the breakers may dash. I shall not sway because He holds me fast. So not today. Glad in the sky. I know it's alright. The Jesus is mine. My soul, my soul, my soul, my soul. My soul has been anchored. 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 The pillows may roll. The breakers may dash. I shall not sway because he holds me fast. So dark today, glad in the sky. I know it's alright. So Jesus is my, my soul, my soul, my 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 soul has been anchored. My soul has been anchored. My soul has been naked. My soul has been naked. My soul, my soul has been naked. 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 Your soul has been naked. My 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 soul has been anchored in Well, good morning, uh, Tabernacle Baptist Church, and welcome to another installment of our Community Conversation. And so today we're going to be talking about domestic violence, domestic abuse. Uh, and so I have with me a friend of mine who I know uh, from Austin, Texas. We went to church together at Sweet Home, the Pinnacle of Praise, and where she's still a member. And, uh, and so this is my friend. Her name is Miss Felicia Mason Edwards, and uh, she works at the Texas Department of Family Protective Services. Uh, she also has a master's uh, in marriage and family therapy. And so she's able to talk about uh, this particular issue. And so we welcome her uh, today uh, to this space as we have this conversation on uh, domestic abuse and domestic violence. So let us pray real quickly and then we'll turn it over. God, we thank you just for another opportunity and moment, Lord, to just come and to hear this, this uh, message. We ask, Lord, that we learn something uh, about this particular topic. Allow us, God, to be better informed so that we can be a better church, a better community, and better Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, Felicia, thank you for being here with me. Uh, thank you so much for answering this uh, last minute so we can have this conversation. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Grudo. So you just tell me how you want to flow and we'll make it happen. Sure thing. So my question is a softball question. Um, domestic abuse, domestic violence, are they the same thing? Are they separate? What is it? Well, really, it's, it's um, domestic abuse is kind of a broad and a large term. So really, it's kind of an incident or a pattern of incidents of really controlling behavior. It could be controlling, it could be coercive, it could be threatening. Um, a lot of times it leads to violence, um, which is what most people tend to see as the physical behavior from that, but it could include sexual violence. Um, a lot of the times it's really caused by a partner, somebody that people are intimately, they intimately know, um, but it also could be a family member. So it's very, very common that most of the cases are experienced by women, however, um, in this day and age, a lot of men are being, you know, perpetrated upon as well by women. And so there's tons of different information. There's tons of ways that people can feel like they're being controlled. 
Um, a lot of it, again, is coercion. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily lead to violence. So physical violence, again, is kind of the number one term that we use. We can physically see some, somebody with a black eye. Um, a lot of it is just, you know, very visual. So we're like, okay, I can immediately identify that, hey, you're being physically abused. Um, but a lot of it really could be psychological as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's telling somebody you're good for nothing. You ain't nobody. Your family doesn't love you. Um, it also could be financial or economic abuse where one person is controlling the money. And so another person, the victim may feel like, well, I can't leave because I don't have a job and I don't have anywhere to go and I don't have any finances. And so there's lots of different kind of forms of what we would call domestic abuse. And particularly nowadays, we have harassment and stalking. Um, and then online. So you got social media, which is a huge issue in the mm -hmm. digital age, where now you're starting to see a lot of digital abuse where people are saying negative things and negative comments about individuals. And so um, the term abuse, again, is really, really broad. And we just typically tend to focus on the physical violence of it when there is so much more that we need to be looking at as a community. Yeah. So so. As I'm thinking about this, so let's let's deal with the broad term abuse then, um, because while I think it's it's important that we deal with the violence piece, we oftentimes miss out on the other pieces because we say they're not as severe, right? However, right. Uh, they're just as detrimental to a person's life. And so, as as I think about this, like how do you best rec recognize some signs? that someone is in an abusive relationship with somebody, domestic abuse. You know, and I think that that's probably the hardest thing to do because again, physical, I can physically see the signs, but emotionally I may not be able to see the signs of what somebody is going through. Um, what I always try to tell people and particularly churches is one, just listen. Um, because what we also know, particularly in the religious realm, is that the Bible can either be used to encourage or to weaponize. And so particularly in domestic violence situation or, or domestic abuse situations, you know, we'll have the Bible and we can misinterpret scripture and say, oh, well, as a as a woman, I don't want to leave my husband, um, even though I may be being mistreated or maybe, you know, it could be psychological, emotional. I don't want to leave because I'm supposed to be submissive. And husbands can say, yeah, you're supposed to be submissive. And if you're not submissive, I have to make you be submissive. And so there's a lot of ways that sometimes the, the Bible can be used to weaponize um, and keep victims in a victimized and bonded state. So sometimes it is really hard to tell, um, you know, if a person is being abused. That's why I say just listen, listen to their stories, listen to the words that they use, the terminology, um, and just be there and be present. Because a lot of times people are not just going to divulge information and say, oh, guess what? I've been abused, you know, financially by my partner or whoever, or I'm being stalked by somebody. Um, it could have been somebody they've been familiar with their whole entire life. And they don't want to tell people I'm being stalked. I, you know, who wants to do that? And so it is hard. Um, but I would just say if, if people can be available um, but then also believe what the victim is saying, because a lot of times people, they'll hear a story and they go, OK, well, you're only giving me the half truth. And so um, they kind of wilter out some of the other stuff and just say, are you? Yeah, I don't know. This kind of sounds far fetched. You know, somebody is stopping you at two o'clock in the morning. Like, is that real? Um, and so but just be able to listen. Uh, definitely have resources available, whether it's national hotline numbers. And I tell people, get to know your local resources in your community, um, whether that's shelters, um, whether that's uh, attorneys that can help answer a lot of the questions that may be a legal issue that, again, I tell churches, you don't have to be an expert in this particular realm. Refer, mm -hmm. refer, refer. It's OK for you to refer. Um, but one, just be available to listen to people's stories believe them and then try to help as much as you can, um, but refer. But it is hard to really understand uh, from a victim's point of view because they have to let you in that door. Right. Um, and so if you're willing to be, again, present, if you're willing to listen, a lot of times, you know, we can ask those questions and, and begin to probe a little bit. It's kind of doing checkups like we do on our family members. Hey, how you doing, sister so-and-so? How you doing, brother so-and-so? And then they come again next Sunday, still having those same conversations. But if they can see that you're attentive to their needs, they're more likely to open up 
and begin to divulge a little bit about themselves. Again, it may not happen overnight. Many times people have been abused for years and they don't divulge that information to anybody. But again, being available, uh, being attentive and listening and being present, allowing them to have a safe space to do that. And that's the great thing about the church is the church is supposed to be the safest place on the planet. And so if the church atmosphere can be a safe place, not a gossiping place, Everybody don't need to know, you know, what's going on in people's homes. That's not what this is about. This is about providing that safe space and, again, providing resources and referring um, as much as you can if you don't, if that, this is not your area of expertise. Yeah, so th- there are a few things that you said uh, that's going to help me lead to this next question. So we talked about, you know, for the church, make sure you have your resources that you can refer people to. Um Make sure that this is not a gossiping space, that it it, that it's a safe space so that if people feel led to share what's going on with them, they know that instead of it getting around to everyone, they're just going to get help. What else would you tell a church or an organization that you need to be able to do if someone tells you that they are they are in an abusive situation? Understand the seriousness. Um, of the situation. I think, again, taking people's word at, you know, in the value of their word and their story, um, just understanding the data for your individual area, you know, national data is, you know, over nearly 20 people per minute are abused. And if you think about that, that's over 10 million people a year. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked up, you know, you know me, I have to look up the Oklahoma data. Um, And so I did look up the Oklahoma data. However, unfortunately, y'all domestic violence data is as old as of 2012. So they haven't really updated it. But um, shame on them. I know. I know. And I was just like, come on now. But really, you know, understanding the seriousness and that 58 percent of the domestic violence, just homicides in Oklahoma they were killed by people with firearms and understanding that firearms is a big thing. And so in terms of looking at what people can do, always think about the safety of the individual. Like, are they going to be safe going back home to that same environment? Are their children going to be safe going back home to that same environment? Um, and tangible ways that if people really want to, you know, if they want to leave a domestic violence situation, um, re- remembering that it's their decision. Mm -hmm. Um, And as a church, I can't force anybody to do that. I can't preach anybody, you know, to tell them, hey, you you really need to do this. And here's some tangible steps. But understanding that ultimately it's that individual's decision about whether or not they go back. And that doesn't mean that that should sever a relationship if that's not the decision that you would choose. Mm -hmm. And so really still being there for that individual until they are ready to make a decision, whatever that may be, in the best interest of their family. Um, I think that's probably key because I know a lot of people will, you know, well, I I think you should leave. And that's great. And that may be the thing in all of our heads that we want to say, leave this situation. Um, But again, it's in their timing. And so still being available, still being present, regardless of their individual decision. Um, Also understanding that Um, having like tangible resources on hand. So for example, if somebody comes to you who is hungry, you give them food. I can't hear you if I'm hungry. I can't, if I need clothing, I'm not going to be able to hear what you're saying to me. And it could be valuable information about resources or whatever it is if I don't have clothing. And so meeting those basic needs, um, food, you know, clothing and shelter are the three basic needs that everybody needs. Seeing if people, do you have a place to stay? Again, this is networking with local shelters, um, local other uh, women's organization or men's organization, whether it's a battered women's shelter, whatever it may be, finding out those local resources in your area. So when you need to make a referral, you already have the number on hand. You know that Donna is going to answer the phone because the church has built a relationship with that organization. And you know that she's the secretary and she can let you in the door or she can say, hey, you know, Pastor Crudup, we may not have an opening today, but we may have one next week. But here's another shelter that you can call. And so it's really finding those local resources in your area that are willing to help. Um, I always tell people also, too, to have an attorney on standby because they can answer some of the legal questions because a a lot of people who are victimized have legal questions about, well, if I do this, then what? Um, What will happen? So it's really finding those resources. 
great resources. You know, Oklahoma has a coalition, coalition against domestic violence and sexual assault. That's a great resource. And I have that number on here as well. Um, people can also call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They give out a ton of resources. Um, but really, as churches, it's really knowing who the partners are in your community and developing quality partnerships, because you never know who's going to walk in your door. You never know what story they're going to have. You never know what issues that they're going through. And that's the great thing about the church is the church is a triage for that type of stuff. We're like we're right. there for that, specifically for right. that. So, yeah. So it, it's not that the church has to be the solution, but the church does have to be the, at sometimes the, the middle person right. to get people what they need. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes um, the, the church and we mean we are part of the church. Sometimes we overstep our boundary because we try to be the solution to everything and we're not. And, and in specific instances like uh, domestic abuse, this is very particular. Um, and some people think, well, I, I'm not trained in it, but I can just give my, you know, my two cents. Mm -hmm. And it's like, sometimes we do more damage than good. And so if we can just refer, and again, partnering is the best way to go. My, my goal is always work smarter, not harder, but partner better. If I can partner better with, with other organizations and, and people in the community, I don't got to work hard because I know who to call when there's an issue that comes up. Um, and that also helps just with visibility. People know that I know that I can go to, to Pastor Crudup's church because he helps people. I understand that because I can see that in the community. I can go to this shelter and they know, you know, him by name. And so it's a great way to also, you know, get visibility in the community with people saying, OK, we got churches that are doing something, not just mm -hmm. talking about it, not just praying about it, saying, oh, we'll have faith and we're going to pray about this issue. No, no, no. We want people to, you know, really put their feet to their faith. Pray about it always, but you're going to have to move your faith and prayer into action. So what are you going to do to help? And so this is tangible ways to actually help people who are in need. Yeah, there's an African proverb that says, when you pray, move your feet. And so mm -hmm. that, that's just what you're telling us, that, that we can't just say I'm praying. Prayer right. always comes with action. And that's so right. when, we're, when we're looking at this, um, now this is, and we have maybe about, hmm, Five minutes left. Mm -hmm. I want you to deal with something that, um, you know, as as a leader of a church, uh, you know, oftentimes we like to shield ourselves from from this. However, you know, like I know that one form of of abuse. And so we're going to step outside of domestic abuse and just talk about abuse is that sometimes it comes from leadership, whether it's pastors, whether it's deacons, whether it's, you know, ministry leaders, whether it's, if you leave this church, you're not, you're not going to go to heaven. And, you know, we the only truth. How does abuse seep into the pews and the pulpits of our churches? And how can we get that thing out of here? Oh my, I'm saying now that's a whole sermon. <laughs> um, you know, I, I definitely would say people are perfectly flawed. And so because the church is made up of, of flawed people, abuse will naturally seep in, whether it's physical abuse, child sexual abuse that's happened in the church. I mean, we've all seen the headlines of, of just around the country. It's not just the Catholic church, it is every church. Um, and so it's there because we're, we're perfectly flawed. Um, the, I think, you know, how to get it out of the church is one, uh, call it out and say its name, because what tends to happen and why things are so silent is because people don't talk about it. We don't want to address it. We don't. Why? Because it seems like, you know, we're flawed as the church and the church is supposed to be this pristine institution. But again, the institution is made up of flawed people. Mm -hmm. And so in order to rectify it, we have to call it out. Um, then we have to ask for forgiveness. Because, you know, the sin is a sin, regardless of whatever, whatever form it's in. And then we have to put things in place so it doesn't happen again. So whether or not, for example, what people have been putting in place specifically for child abuse, um, they've made sure that all of their staff are mandated, you know, have background checks and they make sure that there's training. Same thing with abuse in general. You make sure that your deacons and everybody are trained to understand, one, what abuse is, the different types of abuse, and then how it manifests in the church. 
Because again, our minds are trained to either go sexual abuse or physical abuse. Those are the only two kind of in our mind how we get trained. And so what a great way to look at the totality and the wholeness of the issue and then begin to rectify it and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Create strategies, create policies in in churches. We got a whole lot of policies and some stuff that doesn't make a whole lot of sense sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to create policy, let's create tangible policies that make sense for people. Um, And so I think there's tons of ways to, you know, look at it, figure out ways as a church and as a community to address it and then figure out ways to keep it out of the doors of the church and to say, okay, here's what we're going to do. So at one, it doesn't seep in. But if it's in, here's what we're going to do. Here's our strategy to really look at it and engage it and figure out what we can do to help families, to help children who have been victimized. Um, Because this is the the huge issue is it not only affects the church, again, because we're individuals within the church, it affects everybody down to the kids. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that as a church, we're addressing the issue, not being silent because, you know, the old folks used to say silence is agreement. And so we don't want to agree with the issue of abuse. We want to make sure that we are being vocal and using our voice uh, to advocate for families in who have been affected by this issue. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting you said that, right? Silence is agreement. But at the same time, the church has done a lot around trying to keep certain things under under the radar so people don't know because it'll ruin it'll ruin what we have going on here when they don't realize when you don't expose it get it out of there and put together structures that will keep it from happening again you're gonna you're going to harm your witness Mm -hmm. if you don't do what you need to do at this moment to do the right thing and so you know oftentimes we always want to talk about you know uh abuse um from the standpoint of other people doing it. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that we have to do is also see that as a church, we are complicit when we don't have the resources, when we can get them, that when we're, you know, we're silent, when we can very clearly speak up, where we can help people, all of these areas we can do. It's easy for us to create a book of resources. Some of you already have the resources. And all you got to do is share it. So we put it together in one spot. And so that, you know, this conversation, I know it's quick. These conversations go by really quick. And I just want to thank you uh, for just taking a little time out uh, to talk to us about abuse, domestic abuse, but abuse at a larger scale. Um, it goes just beyond domestic. It's just one of those areas where we see that encountering uh, in our churches and in our relationships. But uh church, you know uh, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done out here. and We've got to decide what kind of church we want to be. Do we want to be the type of church that helps people in these areas when they need it? Or do we want to be the kind of church who knows what's going on, but refuses to say anything or do anything? That's a, that's a conversation for us to have offline once uh, Miss Felicia is gone, but that's a conversation that we must have. So thank you so much for, for having the conversation with me today. I really appreciate you coming. Well, thank you for having me. You know, anything you need, I will be there. That's right. She got me, by the way, y'all, she made me do this, uh, this conference one time in Austin. It was like a family, family systems and mental health and and she was like, no, we need more pastors and preachers to come through and 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 teach on this. And so she got me interested in, in, in mental health and dealing with areas of abuse and learning more about that. So I'm indebted to you for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> you know, people still talk about your session. You know, we just had it last month. So really? Yes. Yep, they still talk. They're like, what was his name again? And I was like, yeah, he's in Oklahoma now. So you know what? Maybe you can do one and just do it virtually next time. Maybe, maybe. Yep. Especially now that we can, we're able to do that. And by the way, guys, I talked about what I always talk about. Black people and seeing ourselves, Black folks in the sacred text. So that's what I talked mm-hmm. about. It was a great time. Now, uh, Tabernacle, you know the deal. After we get done with this conversation, we'll have a short sermonette that covers an aspect of what we talked about today. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. You'll have that sermonette. God bless you all. It is my prayer that you have been enriched by the community conversation on today. It is my prayer that someone who has been a victim of of domestic abuse 
can find relief today. And so today we're going to talk about a very critical conversation and concept that we all uh, must wrestle with today. And so before we get started, I, I would like to render this trigger warning um, that this particular sermon will cover a concept that may trigger your trauma. This is a sermon about rape. And so if in your own mental health, in where you are in your healing process, you are unable to hear a sermon like this, this is your opportunity to log off. I want to, before we get started, shout out real quick this heavyweight, this giant in biblical studies, particularly of the Old Testament, and that is Dr. Will Gaffney at Bright Divinity School, who, whose work on this particular passage that we're about to talk about has been instrumental in how I see the passage. And so you will hear, if you will, a, uh, the, the lines so you will hear the structure that Dr. Will Gaffney provides. There will be some areas where I will directly quote from her book, uh, Womanist Midrash. But I'm indebted to her work and it has helped shape what I see in this text. So I wanna call your attention to a passage that many of us know and some of us wish to forget. That is 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 through 22. This is the story about the rape of Tamar, David's daughter, Absalom's sister. Hear now the word of the Lord. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man, he asked Amnon, Why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace. Go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food here into my bedroom, so I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother! She said to him, Don't 
Force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What, what, what about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. Stop. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out! No! No! She said to him, Sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, Get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornamented robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon your brother been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. And Absalom never spoke to Amnon again. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Let us pray. God, we... We need you to bring healing to the land. Lord, we ask that as we have this tough conversation, that, Lord, it provides healing for those who are struggling today. And God, we ask that where we are complicit, Lord, that you reveal it to us, that we are pushed toward repentance and reparation. And, Lord, that we vow today to build structures and systems that will not allow this to happen again. Not in our homes, not in our churches, not in our communities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk to you today from the subject, If only we let Tamar speak. If only we let Tamar speak. Many of you know, and if you're not aware, that my wife and I, JJ, we have two daughters. I'm claiming the second one uh, because she's not yet here, but we're only a few weeks away, and with God's blessing and God's help, she'll get here. We have a daughter who is around four, four years old. We have one that's due any week now. Two daughters. If I could be honest with you today, it, before we decided to have children, we had conversations about the pros and cons of bringing children into this world. If it happened to be boys, we were apprehensive because of the way they are forced to grow up so quickly to be seen as men in the eyes of people who refuse to see children, who ultimately dehumanize them, hurt them, harm them, see them as criminals or monsters. And it made it no better if they were girls. The reason why is because this world has an infatuation with sexualizing our children, our girls in particular. We have an infatuation with, with taking their innocence. And we struggled because we were in fear, and if we are honest, still in fear, of the possibility of our daughters 
having to deal with sexual harassment, sexual assault, and in particular, rape. We, we had the conversation not too long ago about how prevalent it is for those who are close to your children to be the very perpetrators of sexual assault and abuse against our children. As a matter of fact, the numbers suggest that according to the Department of Justice and their National Crime Victimization Survey, that they took for the years of 2010 to 2016 uh, that they suggest that 8 out of 10 rapes are committed by someone known to the victim. They could readily identify the person who raped them, let alone the ones who committed sexual harassment, who stalked and who sexually abused them. What an indictment that even when we look at the numbers in Oklahoma City, uh, when it talks about um, intimate uh, perpetrators of rape and sexual assault, that roughly 49% of women have been assaulted. At least those are the numbers that have been given. We have a problem. All we have to do is look at the recent years and we see the ex-president who had been recorded saying lewd things about a woman that he was going to force himself on. We hear of a judge that has been recently put on the Supreme Court that had case after case of women coming forward and saying, this man assaulted me. Some to the point who said rape. Still confirmed and placed on the Supreme Court. Oftentimes, women and men are not even believed when they say they have been assaulted. Just in case you think the Bible has nothing to say about this issue, I want to turn our attention to this passage, 2 Samuel 13. Here in this passage we see that someone is always complicit when there is rape and silencing. Allow me, if you will, to recount the passage for you. Amnon, the half-brother of Tamar, says that he is in love with Tamar. <laughs> Dr. Will Gaffney suggests that this concept of love uh, is not an easily explained away concept. Some, some uh, translations say that he, he was infatuated. Others say that he had fallen in love like the New Revised Standard Version and still others may say something a little softer. Uh, but what she suggests is that in this passage, there is no distinction between what we understand as true love and what happens in this text. As a matter of fact, this word that is used is used for real loving relationships in the text. It's used for real familial relationships in the text. It's, it's used for friendships. It's used for how we love God. It's used for all kinds of concepts of love. This term is not a term that we could just easily write off. This term for love shows up as Dr. Will Gaffney says and she explains to us, she says that the simple truth is that there are some people who rape the persons they profess to love. Here Amnon professes to love his half sister and he does not know what to do about it. He falls if you will into some form of depression or sickness because he's in love. He loves his half sister. His cousin, distant cousin, uh, Jonadab, um, uh, uh, 
decides and, and, and gives him a way out for producing a, a situation where he can make his advances. Jonadab tells him that he needs to play sick and ask David to send Tamar to him. And so he does. And David, without thinking, sends his daughter, the princess, who is usually surrounded by guards to keep her unstained by the world, to keep her from having to lose her virginity, to keep her from being abused. He instead sends her by herself to go see her half-brother. When she gets there, she is cooking. And the idea of her cooking uh, arouses Amnon. In fact, Will Gaffney tells us uh, that, that, that the physical task uh, of her cooking uh, enabled him to watch her and the movement of her body as the initial phase of assault. That the assault did not just start uh, with him touching her. It started with him looking at her. She hear his control of her, his surveillance of her, and her submission to his bidding are part of what gratifies him. He's watching her cook. There are people in the room and he can't stand it any longer. And he puts the people out and tells her to come close to his bedroom. When she comes close, he propositions her, come have sex with me. And the text says, it doesn't say not, it doesn't say no, Amnon, don't do this. But it's more direct, don't, don't do this. He advances. He overpowers. He rapes. There she is fighting as he is overpowering her. The text says that after he finished, that his love turned to hate. It displays what was really at stake. He saw her as an object to be used, abused, and thrown away. And when she cries out, don't throw me out. Don't let me leave here in shame. He grabs a servant forces the servant to throw her out the house. And there Tamar walks down the street, weeping and wailing, ashes on her head, ripped clothes to show that there is sorrow. And she goes to her brother Absalom, who shields her in his house, where she lives forever as a desolate woman. Her father finds out gets upset, but does nothing. All of this shows, brothers and sisters, the different areas where we are complicit in somebody's victimization. There are times where we could have done something to stop what happened to another person, but instead, we were complicit. Brothers and sisters, this is what's got to be shared with us today. That you've got to make the decision today to make room for Tamar to speak instead of being complicit. Here's what unfolds. There are three areas that I see where one is complicit. The first is that you are intentionally complicit like Jonadab. Let me chart through the story. Amnon wants his sister, but it was Jonadab who provided the plan. He is intentionally complicit. He is the Maxwell's to the Jeffrey Epstein's. He's the one who presents the structure, who provides the avenue, who makes sure that everything is set up correctly for Amnon to do the raping. Jonadab is just as wrong, is just as evil, is just as complicit. Is Amnon. 
He represents for us all of the people in the world who set up the structures, who provide the space for abuse, who put it on the calendars of high-ranking people, who provide uh, the language to cover it up, who, who decide who gets to know and who doesn't. And more importantly, they represent the people who get away with helping these individuals. Jonadab is complicit because he is the one who had the bright idea. But I can't let Amnon just off the hook like that because it was already in his heart to do to Tamar what he did. But Jonadab was the mastermind. Some of us are complicit in this way. You know who the people are. You put it on their calendar. You shut the curtains. You brought the victim. You told him how to get it done. You said to her how she can harm another. You are the one with the plan. But some of us are like David. David, in my estimation, is considered powerfully complicit. What I mean by this, brothers and sisters, is David has had his own history uh, with sexual assault. He was the one who raped and assaulted Bathsheba, took this woman from her husband, killed her husband, and took her for himself. David sees what's going on and yet he is unaware of the problems his son has of the of the evil in the heart of Amnon and he sends his daughter unprotected and when he finds out it is David who though is angry does nothing at all though he has all of the power to act but maybe just maybe David couldn't act or didn't act because it brought back to his memory what he had done and there are some of us who are complicit in this way we've had our own problems with being the perpetrators of sexual assault of sexual abuse of rape and when it comes back up instead of saying something instead of doing something we let it ride all because we know that what we have done is just as wrong as what Amnon has done but brothers and sisters we also must look at Absalom Absalom for me signifies to us what is unintentionally complicit. Now in the story we might think that Absalom is the hero. Absalom was the one who decided that he was going to take revenge on his brother. He was going to do what his father decided not to do. He was, he was going to defend his sister at all costs. We oftentimes see him as a hero but the text says the one who steps in and does what should have been done against Amnon he's oftentimes seen as the one who takes in his sister and 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 let, allows her to live with him for the rest of her life but can I show you that he's just as complicit for as she tried to cry out it was it was Absalom that told her to be quiet, that silenced her need to speak out, that silenced what was left of the dignity she had in that moment. He silenced her. He told her in the text, don't think anything of it. Don't take it to heart. This is your brother who did this. Don't take it to heart. And like us, who can't quite find the words to say to someone victimized that we love. 
who are trying to find the best way forward oftentimes goes from being a hero to a villain because we silence the voice of people who are hurt. Amnon was killed by Absalom, yes, but Absalom that day also helped to destroy the life of his sister. For she had to live with Absalom, a desolate woman, when she might have been able to live a woman with purpose. All of this is to say, brothers and sisters, that we all can be complicit. Some of us are okay with putting together the systems of making sure that they function for the perpetrators. Some of us, because of our history with how we have catcalled, how, how we have committed uh, sexual violence, how we have stalked, how we have shown up with assault, how we have harmed others sexually, that we are unable to make sure others are protected. And some of us are like Absalom, trying to help, but making things worse. But as I center Tamar back on this story, I wish we would just let her speak. Let her tell her side. To let her say what happened. Yes, what we have to see in the text that we oftentimes don't is that from the very beginning she was already speaking. She started speaking when she didn't pay Amnon any mind. The reason why he was wanting what he wanted was because she had already made it abundantly clear that she did not want him. She was already speaking trying to live her best life as a princess of the kingdom, not worried about her brother, not assuming that he wants her, but she was just trying to live her life. She was already speaking. She was speaking when she went to his room just to do the job her father had done, had told her to do. She was not there to make advances on him. She was not there to entice him, she was there to do a job. She was already speaking about her intentions. And I wish we would just let Tamar speak and let the Tamars of our world speak who are not trying to entice you, who don't want you, but just want to live their life. Let them speak. She was already speaking. When she heard the advance of her brother and she tried everything she could to to beg him to reason with Amnon to fight him off she was already speaking don't don't do this and I wish we would let Tamar speak and the Tamars of this world let's say it together no means no you cannot take from someone what is theirs to give. She was already speaking. Through the very rationalization of trying to get out of the situation. Whether it was saying, what would people think about you? Whether it was, no, don't do this. Whether it was saying, let's go to Father and maybe he'll let me marry you. She said any and everything she could to get away from Amnon. She was speaking. And how many times have those who are victimized, at least those who have said it, and those who are still grappling with saying something, how many times have they made their no their no? And how many times have perpetrators continued to advance? No means no. I wish we would let Tamar and the Tamars of the world speak. But I wish we'd let them speak. Because even after the rape, she started to reason with her brother. Don't throw me out. Don't put me in shame. 
don't, don't, don't continue to harm me by allowing me to go out there and face the public eye while you sit and live lavishly in your palace. How often Tamar can't speak. But I wish we would let Tamar speak today. And the Tamars of this world, those who have to watch their perpetrators rise in every avenue of industry in this world. When we can watch pastors abuse their parishioners and the pastor continues to be loved while the other is pushed out. While we continue to let presidents be presidents when they have abused and those that are abused have lost it all. Those who have to watch their perpetrators become judges in this land and yet they still find themselves on the couch of therapists and counselors for all of those things that have been done those times where the one who was the perpetrator lives their best life but the one who has been victimized loses the joy of living we've got to let Tamar speak I wish Tamar could speak and I wish the Tamars of this world could speak. So let Tamar speak when she's put out the house, but she decides she's going to use her voice and her body to tell the story. The text says that she went out crying, weeping, and with her body she put on ashes and tore her robe. She walked around with the head hung low to tell others what had happened. I wish we would let Tamar speak. And the Tamars of this world who continue to try to call attention to what has been done, who continue to raise their voices, who continue to scream out, whose countenance, whose very attitudes have changed because of the encounter that happened but we refuse to see. I wish we would let Tamar speak. Even when we're trying to do the best we can to come alongside them, I wish we'll never silence their voice. For when she met her brother Absalom, and he told her to be quiet. He sealed her fate in that coffin that day. He made her a desolate woman. He did not speak the life into her that she so rightfully deserved. And I wish we let Tamar speak and the Tamars of this world speak. You are wonderfully and fearfully made. You are beloved by God. And what happened to you is not your shame to carry. It is the burden of the evildoer, the perpetrator, the sick and sadistic one who did it to you. And I wish we would let you speak. Share your pain. Share your hurt. Cry, wail, weep, but ultimately reclaim who you are. Because you don't have to be desolate. The reason why you have become desolate is because we have forced you in that position. But Tamar, whoever you are, whether you are male or female, adult or child, whether you've said it out loud or kept it to yourself, you are somebody and you can speak. Whenever you are ready, you can open up your mouth and you can speak. And there will be someone that will be ready and willing to move out the way and let you speak. And I want to remind you I want to encourage you that Jesus, that God, that the Holy Spirit has come that you can live life more abundantly and that the rape, the victimization, the sexualization of your body is not who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are loved by God. You 
are a mouthpiece for what happened to you and how you can move forward. You, you are not desolate. And if only we would let you speak, this world would change and you could be protected. Amen. This is the opportunity right now for you to come to Christ. So let them in. What decision will you make today? You have three ways to come to Christ right now. You can push the button. There's a button right now that you can push. Or you can type it in right now. Just type in, I want to know Jesus. I accept Jesus. I, I love and want to know Jesus. Type it in right now. Or you can email our pastor at Larry T. Crudup at tbcok.org but whatever you do don't let this moment pass you by get to know Jesus amen and amen It's prayer time. Whatever you're burdened down with, this is a good opportunity to give it over to God. Although we might not know what you're going through, our God does. So wherever you are, just call it out. Call it out. Name the hurt. Name the pain. Name what you're going through. And I can promise you my God hears. My God answers prayer. And so as we pray on this side, you pray as well. And watch God get the glory. Eternal God, our Father, first and foremost, we say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to see another day. Thank you for giving us the activities of our limbs. Thank you for watching over us while we slept and slumber all night. We know if it had not been for you, we don't know where we would be. So we thank you for giving us your grace and mercy yet another day. I pray a special prayer over the Tabernacle family, where they are both near and far. Keep them safe and keep them comforted and keep their minds stayed on you and keep their minds sane. We don't know what it's gonna be like as we continue to go forward in 2021. But we know you still get the glory at the end of the day. So we thank you for that. I pray that somebody has been blessed by the service, that they'll ask, what must I do to be saved? And as we approach Easter, Father God, let us reflect back on what you did on Calvary's cross. Let us have that intimate and personal time to know that what you did on Calvary's cross. We say thank you. Thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, and what you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and the people of God said amen. Well, good day, Tabernacle, Baptist Church, family, and friends. 
It is Women's History Month, and as you know, I am, I am highlighting some women in my life who have poured into my life, trans, transformed the way that I think about ministry and preaching and pastoring and what it means to be a man. So I want to lift for you the Reverend Dr. Martha Simmons, who is the curator of Preaching and Preachers, a weekly Facebook Live broadcast since October the 16th, uh, where each Monday she goes live and she shares sessions on preaching and navigating the 21st century ministry uh, with thousands of preachers around the country. She is also the curator of the Woman of Color in Ministry Project, begun in fall 2013. And this national project offers women of color clergy job assistance, education assistance, advocacy, and mentorship. For, the, for 13 years, Dr. Simmons served as president and executive director of the African American Pulpit Journal, and it is still the only African American owned non denominational homiletics, which means preaching and ministry journal in history. Dr. Simmons also developed the first African American lectionary in the 50 plus year, uh, years of history uh, of lectionaries. The lectionary offers free preaching commentaries. It offers cultural resources and sermon illustrations and designs for worship services for each Sunday and the African American liturgical church year. And guess what church? Ten years ago I was also able to publish my first article entitled The Black Church and the Violence of Urban Education in the Young Minister's Corner of this very same online lectionary called the African American Lectionary curated by none other than Dr. Simmons. And so I'm forever grateful and indebted to her for helping me find my voice. Dr. Simmons has taught me so much through the years about the need for pastors and preachers to be interdisciplinary, to know and pull from different fields of studies, different ways of thinking, to read widely and to understand not only the nuances of preaching, but of church administration and of bringing in experts to help where I am weak. Dr. Simmons showed me how to be authentic how to be realistic about my goals and also how to be fierce in my truth telling. She has helped so many young preachers all around this country, has a joy for helping us. And so Dr. Simmons, thank you for all that you have poured into me and I recognize you on today. Tabernacle, let's hear the brilliance of Dr. Martha Simmons. That song written by bluesman Albert King in 1967, I believe perfectly encapsulates the existential angst that is now reverberating bone deep throughout much of this nation. Many cannot always identify with specificity what it is that is making them anxious, irate, or trepidatious, but in every crevice of their souls, they know things are amiss off kilter and headed in the wrong direction. This is unequivocally evidenced by persons who exert road rage. It animates the political avowal of the slogan, make America great again, by which many mean make it a majority white again. The cultural zeitgeist in which we now live is rooted in divisiveness. You hear it in the trembling voices of our elders who are part of the greatest retirement crisis in the history of the world. Waves of poverty are battering seniors like a tsunami. You hear it in the voices of three million fatigued grandparents caring for children that should not be their responsibility. You hear it from cash-strapped college students who will be enslaved to lending agencies well into their 50s. You hear it in the, de the dejected voices of 70% of Americans who according to the last census only have a high school diploma. 
and know they can't get a well-paying job. You hear it in the voices of young people as they retreat to heroin, meth, and oxycodone to anesthetize their minds from reality. You hear it in the inconsolable cries of sexual abuse victims, muted by the Catholic Church with the latest case involving 50 more priests in Pennsylvania, as so many are engrossed in lauding the Pope. You hear it in the perplexed voices of Latinos who wonder why others who also were once detested immigrants in America are now so unwelcoming. You hear this angst in the voices of Black Lives Matter activists who are stunned by what I know to be contemporary manifestations of old biases and symptomatic of old hatred. You hear it from the 13 million children who are in poverty and live under the tyranny of hunger, homelessness, and miseducation. And you hear it, you hear this angst in the throats of preachers who in the backdrop of declining church attendance are necessitated to work pro bono or become bivocational just to feed their families and themselves. So, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does all of this mean? I believe it means good news on graduation day at this Presbyterian seminary. I believe that all of this angst means that it is an unquestionable incomparable, actionable, invaluable, remarkable time to be a preacher. It's a spiritual signal for those who have ears to hear and a sign for those who have eyes to see. Graduates, this is your moment. This is why you were formed in your mother's womb. Times like these affirm your purpose and reconfirm your marching orders. Motwan said the open wound of life or suffering in this world is the starting point of theology. It's an unquestionable, incomparable, actionable, invaluable, remarkable time to be a preacher. So go. Go and maximize your degree. Go be a preacher. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and you can insert Holy Parent there if you want to. In the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Because. Amen. Amen. It is now time for our tithes and offering. It's an opportunity for everyone to give back to the ministry that has done so much for you. You have three ways that you can give. One of those ways is to send it to our post office box. And that's Tabernacle Baptist Church, post office box 54512, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73154. Or you can push the button and just give that way. And for those of you who are tech savvy, you can use the Give a Fly app. And just go on there, search for Tabernacle Baptist Church. You'll see our illustrious pastor's face, and you can give that way. But whatever you do, let's give back to God for what he has done for us. Amen and amen. Good morning, Tabernacle Baptist Church. Our morning announcements for week March 28th through April 3rd, 2021. TBC on the Move, Identity by Design Bible Study every Wednesday night at 5.30 p.m. And our virtual book study, second, Sunday, second Saturday of each month at 2.30 p.m. TBC activities has been canceled or postponed. All scheduled in-person plan activities for the months of March and April are canceled or postponed until further notice. 
please practice social distancing and remain safe and healthy. Join us live and in person for our parking lot praise service Easter Sunday. He is risen Sunday, April 4th at 11 a.m. Please join us in your parking lot praise. Community Efforts, our TVCOK virtual book club. The book title for this month is Just As I Am by Cicely Tyson. The meeting is held the second Saturday of every month from 2.30 to 4 o'clock p.m. Please email Stephanie Tucker for the Zoom link and password. For more information, contact Stephanie Tucker at setucker1979 at gmail.com. That's Stephanie Tucker. TBC OK Church Check In. Join us April 9th at 6 p.m. just to check in to say how you're doing. Welcome back. The check in will, um, you will receive an email or a Zoom link. Again, let me repeat that. The check in, you shall receive your Zoom link either in an email or mail. So please be on the lookout for that. Sunday School, join us every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. promptly. Dial in at 978-990-5365, access code 249-2296. Again, that's 978-990-5365, access code 249-2296. Worship with us every Sunday at 11 a.m. and Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. You can join us at liveauthenticallytbc.online.church or dial in to join at 563-999-1001, access code 477-619-POUND, Facebook or our YouTube channel. Have a great week. March 28th through April the 3rd. Thank you. What a wonderful worship experience we've had today. It is our prayer that you learned a little bit more about prayer, that you learned how to worship today, that you worship God, that you felt the presence of God through our prayers, our scriptures, our worship, and the sermon. And now it is time for us to reconvene, or now it's time for us to go home, to log off. If you want to know more about who we are as a church, all you have to do is look no further to our benediction litany, and you will find who we are and what we stand for. As we read this, let us read it with fervor. As we leave this tabernacle, enliven us to live out our mandate in the world. Remind, Remind us that, that we are a church, church that's helping, helping everyday people, people encounter an extraordinary God for authentic living. Fill us with the right motives in our Christian living. Let, Let the, the values, values of compassionate, compassionate living, connectedness, God moments, and good news be our guide. Help us to spend our days making disciples for you. Help us to reveal your word, encounter your presence, engage humanity, and reflect on the growth that only you give. Help us to be examples of excellent ministry and faithful discipleship. Let us strive every day to crave Christ's likeness and to give contagiously. Let our hearts break for the hurting, and in all that we do, let worship be a lifestyle. We trust you, Lord. Receive the benediction at this time. Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority for all time and now and forevermore. And the people of God say amen. Encourage each other with these words. I pray for you, you pray for me, I love you, I need you to survive, I won't harm you with words from my mouth, I love you, 
I need you to survive It is His will that every need be supplied You are important to me I need you to survive You are important to me I need you to survive Go and live authentically, TBC Go and live authentically Thank <laughs> you.